We are coming to the end. We're actually wrapping up this morning our sermon series that we've titled The Resurrected Life. We've been in it for the last four weeks. This is week five. And uh, we've simply kind of looked at what it means uh, to, to know Jesus and to operate out of the power of his resurrection. Uh, also, what it means to share in his sufferings. Like, what does all of this mean? How, how has my life changed because I have now surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior? Now, look, five weeks is nowhere close to covering everything. Uh, we've had to pick a few of these things that I, I believe were right and necessary and timely for where we are as a community. There's so much more we could have said, um, but it has been an incredible sermon series. And, and so we do come to the end. Uh, then next week, we will have uh, what we call an elder-led prayer. Uh, we're going to spend some time praying and singing. It's going to be incredible. The last one was amazing. I'd encourage you to show up to it next week. It's going to be equally, if not better, than the one we had. And then after that, we begin a brand new sermon series, and we're going Old Testament. Yeah. All right, we're going Old Testament. We're going to a, a book that I think some people would be aware of, and if you're not, you probably know a few of the individuals that are in that book. We're going to be looking at Judges. All right, Judges. And so uh, if you want to get ahead, you're more than welcome to start reading it. Uh, just brace yourself. Uh, read very slowly. Um, because the things that happen in there are horrendous. Um, many of you would know Samson, and you would know Deborah. You might even know Gideon or Gideon. Uh, depends where you went to school or how you were brought up. Um, but there's so many other people in there. Uh, and because it is God's word, it is rich, it is beautiful, and it has purpose because it reveals who God is and what that means for us today. All right, so we'll be in the book of Judges, and I'm super excited about that. But this is the resurrected life part five, the finale. And if I was to title it, I, I would give it this uh, title. The, the resurrected life is a life of hope, of joy, and an end of love. All right, the resurrected life is a life of hope, of joy, and of love. If you have a Bible, you can meet me in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be in the first nine verses. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to pray. Uh, I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, uh, that God would do that which only he can do, and that is save many. And so, Father God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, we pray that it would transform our hearts yet again, that it would reveal to us who you are. And as we see you, Lord, I hope that we would understand what it means to be your children. Lord, I ask that you would save many this morning, not just in this location, uh, but everywhere where your people have gathered and the word is being preached. Save many, heal many, restore many, reconcile many, all for your glory. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Amen, amen. First, Peter chapter 1. Here, here's how it begins. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so right out the gates, we're told who wrote this letter. See, Peter had been appointed by Jesus himself. And he was an authoritative messenger, an interpreter of the gospel. Peter of all people. Now look, if you know a little bit about Peter, you might go, man, I wonder how he made it. Right, this is the same Peter who was rebuked more than any other disciple. This is the same Peter who, who dared to rebuke Jesus. This is the same Peter who denied Jesus more forcefully and publicly than any other disciple. And still, he was not beyond the grace of God. And was used powerfully by God. Friends, I hope that this would tell you that there is hope for you. That you are never to anything to be used by God. You are not too young. You are not too old. You are not too uneducated. No, 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 no. All God requires of you is to be faithful and available. And then watch him work. God's power. Incredible. Unbelievable. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Then says... To those chosen, living as exiles dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, 
chosen. This letter is written to God's people living in exile. Why? Well, because uh, this world is not their home. That's what it means when it says they're, they're exiles, exiles to this world. That this is not our home. And just like them, for those who've crossed the line of faith, for those who have surrendered to Jesus, this is not your home. You need to stop living like it is. That our, our home is with God in heaven. They are God's elect and chosen, we are told. I love that word, to be chosen. God chose you. You did not choose God. Left to your own, you would never choose God. But it's God who initiates. It's God who stretches out his hand, his hand of mercy and grace and love. They are chosen. Peter's letter was what they called a circular letter addressed to the churches in the Asia Minor area, all, con all contained today in modern-day Turkey. The order in which the provinces are listed suggests the order in which the courier would deliver the letter as he traveled roughly in a circular kind of motion. Chosen, we're told. Chosen. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, there's that phrase, sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's somewhat confusing, to be honest. If you read it for the first time, you're going, man, this seems a little bit weird. Like, why would I be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus? <laughs> well, Peter here is like, that old uncle who simply loves the old school jams, who plays them on a vinyl on a Saturday afternoon. See, this use of language is Old Testament. This sprinkling of blood, it's Old Testament language. And what Peter does is he brings it into the New Testament to show us that God made a promise over there and fulfills it in Christ here. See, there were three situations in the Old Testament where blood was sprinkled. The first one is at the establishment of a, a covenant on Mount Sinai, Exodus 24, verse 5 to 8. The establishing of a covenant, of an agreement, of a relationship. Second place we can see the sprinkling of blood in the Old Testament is at the ordination of Aaron and his sons to become the priests. Those who, who would stand as, as the kind of in-betweeners between God and the people. Exodus 29, verse 21. And then at the purification ceremony for cleansing a leper, we would see the sprinkling of blood. Leviticus 14, verse 6 and 7. Why am I telling you this? Well, because the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus on us accomplishes the same thing that it did in the Old Testament. Firstly, a covenant is formed, Luke 22, verse 20. This is at the Last Supper. Jesus holds up the cup, and he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. Then we are ordained as priests to him. What Peter later goes on to talk about, the priesthood of believers, he says. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. And then finally, we are cleansed from our sin, 1 John Chapter 1, 7. You see, Peter's going, hey, what happened in the Old Testament, Jesus has fulfilled. He has accomplished. There is a new covenant. You, you have a new identity, the priesthood of all believers. And you are cleansed of your sin. Each of these is ours through the work of Jesus on the cross. His death and resurrection secures them for us. This is why the, the, the cross is so beautiful. And this is why the cross should never get old. Is that as we look to the cross, we are reminded of what God has done in Christ by the power of the Spirit. It's also important for us to see in Peter's introduction is that our salvation and our sanctification is a work of the Trinity and not human effort. Friends, let me give you a little, uh, little tip here. When you're reading the scriptures, always try to see where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are. Because that, that's how they operate. They always operate like that. 
They are never too far away from one another. See, what we've done is we've tried to separate them. Some of us fall in love with God the Father, and we're like, you know, I get that Jesus has done some really cool things, but it's God the Father. Some of us are so captivated by Jesus and and the grace and and the mercy and the sacrifice that that's all we think about. And we go, yeah, but but you know, God the Father, yeah, 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 no, I get it, I get it. He sits on a throne somewhere and he he barks out orders and rules, but it's Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit, well, this one is either abused or not even spoken about, right? He is a person, a real, like a, he's part of the Trinity. And our salvation and our sanctification is a work of the Trinity. Right out the gates, Peter's just like, in, my, like in his intro, he's just like, hey, I just want to make sure that you guys understand this. We are foreknown by God, sanctified by the Spirit, and made to be obedient by Jesus. This is why Peter then says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. He is so blown away. He's just like, you know what? I'm going to stop. I know I'm giving you the intro. I'm telling you who I, like, no, no, no. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Would you just get more and more and more of this? Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, our salvation is a new birth into a living hope. Say living hope. Living hope. It is a new birth into a living hope. Not just any hope, but a living hope. And this living hope is a positive expectation about the future. That's what it means. A positive expectation about the future. Unlike the, 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 the hope that, 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 that we talk about in our everyday lives. I hope my team wins. I hope I'll pass my exams. I hope I'll win that competition. I, I, it's like you're unsure. You don't know, right? You, eyes closed and you're like, oh, I just I really hope. Crossed fingers, I hope. No, 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 no. That, that is not the living hope that Peter's talking about here. D- Dr. John Piper says it this way. Biblical hope not only desires something good for the future, it expects it to happen. And so I wonder as the church, do we live in this kind of expectation? That, that God will do that which he said he will do. I think too many of us, we show up and we're just like, oh, I don't know, you know. We'll sing the songs and we're like, oh, I don't know. We'll hear the word preach, mm, I don't know. That is not living hope. It's to live in expectation that this will happen. Because God is faithful. He is faithful. See, when you and I were born the first time, John chapter 3, Nicodemus, but we don't have time for that right now. When you and I were born the first time, it was into a dead hope. Now, I know it was a beautiful moment. Some of you probably have pictures. I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe, maybe your folks talk about it or, or your grandparents talk about it or your family talks about it. In fact, you probably got a really cool name that's connected to what was going on at the time. What an experience. But the reality is that all of us were born into a dead hope. We were born to die. However, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is a better future for those who have crossed the line of faith. Because though the call is to die, your reward is life. This is why Jesus calls us to die to ourselves. Because he's saying the reward is life. Whereas the world is going, no, 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 come and live. Come and live the hashtag good life. Your best life now. In that reality, your destination is death. Peter extends this beautiful truth. He goes on to say in verse 4, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, 
undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That no matter what has happened in your life today, this very morning, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, if you've crossed the line of faith, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you read these words and you go, oh my goodness, I am an heir of God. That's what it means. Like being a child of God means that there is something waiting for you that is sure, that is certain, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And this matters. It matters because it gives you and I hope for a better day. A living hope. A day in which you will take ownership of this inheritance. That it will be yours. It's promised. Remember, God is faithful. Paul used three terms to describe the inheritance of our hope. Our inheritance is imperishable. It is not prone to corruption or decay. Our inheritance is undefiled. It is not susceptible to contamination. Our inheritance is unfading. Its beauty and glory is continuous. Friends, could there be a better inheritance than the one we are promised here? I mean, how different is, is our inheritance from that of an earthly one? And when I say us, I'm referring to the church, to the people of God. Like, how different is it from an earthly one? Well, I mean, what can you inherit in this world that does not soon lose its attractiveness and appeal? Let's, let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. I mean, uh, look, I'll, I'll go ahead and confess. It's confession time. Uh, I am part of the cult uh, that is working on our issues with regards to Apple products. <laughs> okay, I, I shared it. Some of y'all are looking at me like, what, what did he say? What did... I love Apple products, all right? That's, that's what I'm saying. I have a massive problem. Pray for me. But, 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 but even as amazing as Apple is, and it still is Android people, <laughs> as, no, oh, yeah, that one, that, that one is going to get me in trouble. I know I'm going to get all the, WhatsApp messages and the gifts and the... Uh, but anyway, even as amazing as Apple is, they come out with a phone, how often? So, 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 so you'll, be like, you'll be like, oh, this is so incredible. I got the late... I mean, it does the, the thing and it does like, wow, and it does the... It's amazing. And then it doesn't even take a year before you're like, ah, this thing is outdated. This thing has lost its... There is nothing in this world that we can compare to the inheritance that we have waiting for us. In fact, what can you inherit in this world that does not at some point perish altogether? You inherit money, but before you know it, someone else is spending it. Before you know it, it's all gone. S Solomon, King Solomon said this, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 11, he says, the, the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth? Except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers. Or to quote the old urban poet, Christopher George Latour Wallace, more money... I mean, I think Solomon said it better. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You inherit a business, and before you know it, instead of you running the business, the business is running you. You inherit a house, and before you know it, the geezer is leaking, and now you have a never-ending cockroach issue. And I have never met anyone who goes, hey, you know what? I don't really mind cockroaches. Like, there's a whole other stuff would be like ants. Yeah, okay, they're an issue, whatever. But cockroaches, it's just, it does something to us. And here we are going, oh, my inheritance, my...
all material inheritances are doomed to be lost. And so while they have their place, we should not put our confidence in them. We should set our sights on something greater. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Isn't it interesting how the things we treasure so much, we, we, we don't even like have them on us all the time. We end up hiding them somewhere. Hey? And then worrying about things that will probably never happen. So we're hiding it, this thing that's so amazing, but I'm hiding it. And I'm worried the whole time. I'm anxious the whole time. That's not the case for our inheritance that is kept for us by God. Hear me, friends. Earthly inheritances, while pretty nice, do not offer the hope we truly need. Our hope, on the other hand, involves an inheritance that is endless, eternal, and everlasting. Peter tells us, why for the resurrected lives we can be secure about our heavenly inheritance. He, he, he goes on to say, guys, listen, trust me. Here's why you can go, this is for sure. He says in verse 5, you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That if you are truly born again, that if you are a true child of God, you are going nowhere. And this is not because of your power to hold on to God. It is because God has his powerful grip on you. It's not because of you. Our hands are so slippery because of sin and, 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 and evil and brokenness, but it's God who has his powerful grip on us. And he will never let you and if that is true of my salvation, how much more about our inheritance? How much more about our inheritance? Like, so, like I'm secure in my identity in Christ. And yet when it comes to what awaits me, I'm so, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm nervous. I don't know. How? God gave us his one and only son. His one and only son. Why would he withhold anything else from us? And that's what Satan will have us believe. He'll be whispering in our ears, like, yeah, but, I mean, can God really provide for you? Will God really come through for you? It's in that moment we go, uh, shut up. I look to the cross, yes. Jesus is no longer on that cross. He is no longer in the grave. And so, yes, I believe. Peter then transitions here after going, I need you to understand that the, 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 the resurrected life is a life of hope and not just any hope, but living hope. He, he goes, let's talk about some other things here as well. See, the main theme in verses three and five is that resurrected lives should praise God because of the certainty of their hope. Peter then shifts, but only slightly, in verses six and nine. He then focuses on joy and love that is meant to fill the lives of Christians, regardless of their circumstances or challenges. Verse 6, he says, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Friends, remember our anchor verse, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, where my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. This is what holds us up as we read this text here. You suffer grief in various trials, and yet you're telling me that I can still rejoice? 
How, how, how is that? How is that, Peter? Because uh, let's be honest. Trials are horrible. They suck. I don't want to go through a trial. I don't want you to go through a trial. But for the children of God, trials have a purpose. They have a purpose. You could say trials are designed for three things. To prove your faith, to develop your faith, and to glorify our Lord and Savior. Let me give them to you again. To prove your faith, to develop your faith, and to glorify our Lord and Savior. Here's the thing. You never really know what you believe until you face a test. Our faith isn't tested because God doesn't know how much or what kind of faith we have, no. It is tested because we are often ignorant of how much or what kind of faith we have. Let me, let me say that again. Our faith isn't tested because God doesn't know how much or what kind of faith we have. It's not like God's pacing back and forth and going, I have no idea. I don't know if he's going to believe me today or not. I don't, I don't know. Holy Spirit, what do you think? I don't know. I don't, let's watch together. Our faith is tested because we, it's you and me, we are often ignorant of how much or what kind of faith we have. God's purpose in testing is to display the enduring quality of our faith. The enduring quality of our faith. What he began, he will bring to completion. To, to quote the great Charles Spurgeon, and I, I wish I could read this to you in the accent that he probably had as, a, as an Englishman, but I, I won't do it. But here's what Charles Spurgeon says. Indeed, it is the honor of faith to be tried, to be tested. Shall any man say, I have faith, but I have never had to believe under difficulties? Who knows whether you have any faith? Shall a man say, I have great faith in God, but I have never had to use it in anything more than the ordinary affairs of life, where I could probably have done without it as well as with it. Is this to the honor and praise of your faith? Do you think that such a faith as this will bring any great glory to God or bring you any great reward? If so, you are mightily mistaken. This is why I believe we should have the same spirit and attitude of James when he says in James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4, consider it great joy. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I love these two verses because you, can, you read them forward, but you can work them back as well. And so let's do that. You want to lack nothing? Then be mature and complete. Allow endurance to have its full effect. Endurance that comes from faith, that comes from being tested in our faith. How? Well, when we go through various trials. And so if that's the case, consider it pure joy, all joy, great joy. I want to grow in my faith. Actually, let me take another. I want to live like someone who lacks nothing. And I'm not talking about material things. I want to be able to say, like Paul said in Philippians, a misunderstood, misquoted verse where I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Okay? 
But what does he say before that? I've had a lot, and I've had little. But I've remained content, Paul says. I live like one who lacks nothing. And I don't know anyone who had their faith tested like Paul. He ran the race with endurance. That's the call for all of us. And so when trials come, I know they're painful, they're, they're, they're horrible, they're, but, but pause for a moment and go, okay, God, what are you doing here? What's, what's going on here? One of the things that it should tell you is that God is present in your life. That by the mere fact that you're saying, God, God, what are you doing? You're acknowledging that he is here. God, what's going on here? Lean into the work of the Spirit. Let him grow you. Let him mature you. It's crazy how we're always able to look back when we went through a trial and we go, man, I, I, it's, it was horrible, but I'm a better person for it. This is why we rejoice. This is how we find joy, because we realize that God is still at work. Let's go back to Peter here. Verse 8 and 9, he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. You know, inexpressible and glorious joy. This is, in the original language, this is the only place where you can find that word. The English has taken it and created it to be a phrase, um, but when Peter wrote it, it was a word, and it's the only place in the Bible. See, I believe Peter was writing this, and he was so blown away by what God had done through Jesus by the power of the Spirit in his life. He just, he's like, I, I just, I, I don't know. I need to talk about a joy that is not from this world. And so he just makes up a word. But now that word is, is eternal because it now sits in God's word. To, to try to explain what was going on, he's just like, I just, I can't. I, I, I don't have words. I don't, ah, let me scribble and see what comes up. Do you have that kind of joy? We're told here that we love Jesus, the call is to love Jesus, and we do so by seeking to glorify him. We should be constantly asking ourselves in our lives, in our daily lives, how can I bring him the most glory? You wake up in the morning and you should be like, God, how can I give you glory today? You show up at that meeting, God, how can I give you glory here? In your community, in your suburbs, in where, how, how, God, can I bring you the most glory whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. In doing so, you, you, you're saying, I, I, I love you, Jesus. I, I want my life to be about you. I love you. And so that's the call. We believe Jesus by obeying him. It's another way to love him. How, how do I know that I love Jesus? Well, it's because I obey him. I obey him. I love the words of Jesus' mother at the wedding. Some of you might know of the story when they ran out of wine. And so she goes, so, uh, you never, you never, yeah, I, guess, I guess you never want to run out of wine. But Je Mary then goes, goes to Jesus and, and she tells him, and I love Jesus' response. He's like, what am I supposed to do about this? It's not, it's not my issue. She does, pays him no attention. Turns to the servants and then, and then she says this, do whatever he tells you, and walks away. Do whatever he tells you. The call is to obey Jesus. We love Jesus, and so we, we always go, how can I glorify you with my life? The first thing is just to obey him, to take him at his word. And so if he says serve, you serve. If he says give, you give. 
It's crazy how so many people, I mean, just, just those two things were like, I don't know. <laughs> like, what, what else does it say? Is there no, something else, Jesus? Is there, like, where's my favorite verse that just says, um, if he says serve, you serve. If he says give, you give. If he says forgive, you forgive. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. And I, just, I, I want to show you how serious God's word is about God's commandments. Let me, let me show you. On the issue of forgiveness, Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. At the end, he says this. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. That's in the Bible. Jesus later then says in Matthew 18, in the parable of the unforgiving servant, as he concludes his teaching on forgiveness, he says this, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Forgiveness is, is serious. It's serious. Because what we're being told here is that if we don't forgive, then God won't forgive you. Paul takes Jesus' words and applies them as he addresses the, the church. He says in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Then he adds, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. See, in, in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul identifies a reviler as an example of unrighteousness. Now, what is a reviler? Well, it's somebody who hates and holds grudges and is unforgiving and bitter. People like that don't go to heaven. N not because kindness earns them heaven, no, but because kindness is a fruit of the Spirit, which is given to those who have been broken by the love of Jesus and have been embraced by the sweetness of being forgiven, even though at one stage they were enemies of God. So if Jesus calls you to forgive, you forgive. Now, <laughs> I'll go ahead and say it. Left to my own, there's no ways I would forgive. I just wouldn't. People who have hurt me, people who continue to hurt me, the call is to forgive. It's to make a decision and say, I choose to forgive you. And this requires supernatural power. It requires resurrection power. Jesus on the cross, looking at those who had put him there, and he goes, Father, forgive them. He didn't wait for them to go, okay, I'd like to have a conversation with you, Jesus. Jesus. Forgive them. It's a decision that you make. Healing is the process. I'd like to separate those two things. Forgiveness and healing. I think we've put them together. No, no. Forgiveness is a decision. I, I, am, I am, by the power of the resurrection, I'm choosing to forgive you. Now I'm going to walk with Jesus as he heals me. And so I... I wonder, even in this very room, how many people are holding on to unforgiveness? Been hurt by a father, been hurt by a mother, been hurt by a sibling, been hurt by a friend, been hurt by a partner in some business deal that went south, been hurt by your boss, been hurt by your neighbor, been hurt by another Christian. cannot hold on to unforgiveness. It will kill you. And that is why we step into the power of God and we say, Lord, I need you. I need you to help me forgive. If he calls you to forgive, you forgive. If he says get into community, you get into community. 
Because we, we need to stop playing with God's word. It's not just good advice. It's not like a, a self-help book that you'll find at the bookstore. No, no. Th- these are the very words of God and they have purpose. And so when he says get into community, it's because he has something good for you. If he says you must go and share the gospel, you go and share the gospel. If he says love, you love. We obey Jesus. See, the problem is that some of us, we think we trust and believe Jesus, but sadly, we're still at the negotiating table trying to work out the terms and conditions of our salvation. The, The problem is that you actually don't realize that you're the only one at the table. Because Jesus doesn't negotiate. Satan will have you believe that you can, no, 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 no. Before you enter into the kingdom, you can actually sit at the table and work this out. Ask him, ask him for for the good life. Ask him that, hey, if, if you do this, then he must do that. You are the only person at the table. Salvation is by faith and faith alone. Trusting and believing in Jesus is not a feeling. It's a decision. It's a decision to obey. Feelings feelings are connected to, to what's happening in my life. Another way to say it is happiness is connected to my happenings. Joy is connected to the fact that I made a decision to follow Jesus and to take him at his word and to trust and believe in him. The resurrected life rejoices in Christ and loves Christ because they, we, you, are receiving the goal of your faith. Peter calls it salvation. Look with me, verse 9, he says, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, this is not a reference to eternal salvation. It's not a reference to when you first come to Christ. We know this to be true because of what we see in verse 4 when he talks about our inheritance. He's talking to people who've already crossed the line of faith. This salvation here is talking about our future eternal rewards that await us. This is why we do what we do is because we we recognize that we have been loved so much by God that he sent his son Jesus to come and die for us. And we receive that invitation. And then we live. We are liberated. And so therefore we live as free people being obedient to what he has commanded us to do until he either calls us home or returns. Liberated and free. I like to see them as two different things. See, the the Israelites were liberated from, from Pharaoh and Egypt. And so now they found themselves kind of in the wilderness, and that's a whole another story to how they got there. But they are uh, away from their oppression. They've been liberated from their bondage. And now the call is to live like free people. But they struggle. Because they still hear the voice of Pharaoh in their ears. Let me give, you, let me give it to you this way. Um, I, I grew up in boarding school. Uh, all of high school, I was in boarding school. And, uh, and they used to wake us up with like this alarm. Like someone would wake up at, uh, I remember it was 6 o'clock, the first one would go. And then at 6.10, the second one would go. And then at 6.15, the third one would go. If you were not up by 6.15, you were in trouble. So that's how it went. Now, I would go home during the holidays, about four times a year. And, and the first three days, I'd just find myself waking up at six o'clock. No siren, no bell, no nothing. Just like, what, what is good? Like it took me three days to get out of that, hey, there's, there's no one calling you to wake up at six. There is no bell that's being rung. See, I'd been liberated from school, even though school is a good thing, so please... <laughs> If you're in school, continue. <laughs> I'd been liberated from school, but, but, but I, I now needed to live as a free person who is now on holiday. Many of you have been liberated, but you don't live as free people. You just don't. 
on a how do you know. I see how you handle your, your time, your money, your relationships. Live as free people. And we do so until Jesus returns or he calls us home and we know that we have an inheritance that awaits us. This is why we can say the resurrected life is a life of hope, joy, and love. And so the question is, do you have hope? Do you have joy and do you have love? Those are good indicators to assess your own life and to go, where am I in light of this? If the resurrected life is a life of hope, living hope, it's a life of joy regardless of what's going on in my life and a life of love because I am loved by the Father. Therefore, that love flows in me and through me to love others. That's the resurrected life. And so I'm going to call the band up. And before we sing to close out, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for all of you. And, and my hope is that you would respond to the gospel. Every week, my hope is that you would respond to the gospel. For some of you, it's, it's taking that first step to go, you know what, I, I, I'm realizing for the first time that there is an invitation, that God is calling me. He's stretched out his hand and he's saying, come. Maybe for some of you, it's to live as free people. What is it that you are holding on to that's keeping you from living as a free person, a free child of God? Maybe for some of you it's realizing that you're holding on to unforgiveness and you need to let that go. My hope is that you, you would not leave this place before crying out to God and saying, God, help me to forgive. Do you know the name? Release me, God. Today, this very moment is an opportunity for you to do that so that you might live the resurrected life. So that you might know him and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings. So that you might be able to worship because the Lord is your banner. So that you might be able to sow and reap in, in all of life. So that you might be on mission the greatest adventure that you'll ever be on so that you might have hope and joy and love. Let's respond to the gospel, friends. It demands it. And so let's pray. Lord Jesus, creator and sustainer of the world, Help me. I know more than anything that I need your love. I want to love like you love, but I know me. And I know that left to myself, love quickly becomes about me, myself, and I in the most destructive way. Destructive to others and destructive to myself. Please, right here, right now, pour out your Holy Spirit in me, on me, and through me. Holy Spirit, I desire you to rule and reign in every part of me. I completely and wholeheartedly yield to you. Mind, heart, body, and soul. I surrender. Here I am. Here I am. Down on my knees. I'm asking that you fill me in the same way you filled those at Pentecost. I'm not thinking about how this has been used or abused in the history of the church or how false preachers have manipulated others with it or how society and popular culture has mocked it. I'm talking about you stirring in my soul like a rushing wind. And I don't care what that looks like or sounds like. Why? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I want all you have to offer. Fill me, overflow me, rule me and reign in me. Shake things up in me. Shake my foundations. 
If they are not found in you and rooted in you, then God, would you do a new thing in me? Father God, baptize me in the power of the resurrection. Change me forever. Jesus, I want to follow you and walk in your ways. Fill me with your love. For without it, I am just empty noise. Lord, when people meet me, I want them to see your reflection and hear your voice. Jesus, rain down your love in and on and through me. Lord, put your hand on my shoulder. Give me eyes to see people the way you see them. Give me your love for others, for all those who the world considers as unlovable. I want a powerful, tenacious, merciful, long-suffering, keep no record of wrongs, kind, gentle, forgiving, sacrificial kind of love. A love that makes no earthly sense that it must come from a heavenly place. From your heart to mine. I want to walk away from here changed forever. Change me from the inside out. Jesus, your father loved us and gave us you, his only son, as a way to get back to him. You obeyed without protest and came here on a rescue mission. You walked into the slave market and said, I will purchase them all. And when the market owner demanded payment, you poured out every drop of blood in your body. You held nothing back. Propitiation, a price that satisfies. Jesus, when I look at what you did for me, I am flabbergasted, shocked, astounded, amazed. Because again, I know me. And so do you. And still you died for me. Jesus, you are the very definition of love laid down and love poured out. And so I surrender everything right here, right now. Have your way in me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.